Amen. The Lord bless you. I am reading from Psalm 23, verse 4. Psalm 23 and verse 4. Psalm 23, verse 4 says, Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are rod and your staff, they comfort me. Amen. So, David, I, I want to talk about the second part. I'll not talk about the valley of the shadow of death. I want to talk about the second part that says, For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David is saying that the evidence that God is with him, he knows God is with him because he sees the operation of his rod and his staff consistently in his life. And in the psalm that uh, Bishop began to do an exposition of, David takes time to consistently, in every verse, he takes time to consistently show you different evidences of the fact that God is with him. And the evidences that I have called the evidences of with me. In verse 1, he says the evidence, one of the evidence that you are with me is that I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd and because he is with me, I shall not want. Then in verse 2, he says, another evidence that the Lord is with me is that you can literally see physically that he makes me to lie down in green pastures. That as you, as you watch his life, you can consistently see that God is bringing him to green pastures consistently. And then also in verse 2, he says again that the evidence of with me is that he leads me beside still waters. That is also another evidence that David is talking about. Then in verse 3, he goes to a different type of evidence. Because these are evidences that you can see with your eyes. You can see the progressions of his life that this man never lacks. This man is consistently... Uh, going into green pastures. His life is consistently flourishing because he is like uh, the river that is planted beside uh, uh, the, the, the tree that is planted beside the river. So uh, in verse 3, he gives us another evidence. Now this one is internal. He's the only one who knows about this one. That even as you see these things happening in his life physically, he says another evidence in verse 3 is that my soul is being restored. That as a, as a result of my relationship with God, I can consistently feel that my soul is being restored. My wounds are being healed. Eh? There, there is, as Bishop has said this morning, that there is a consistent lift up in my spirit every time I am low. And he says that, the, he gives an evidence of with me, the evidence that internally, as these things are happening outside, internally, I can feel my soul being restored. Then another evidence is that he consistently leads me, even from within. Then where we are in verse 4, part B, he says that another evidence that the Lord is with me is the consistent operation of his rod and his staff in his life. And as Bishop has said, the staff was a long stick and it was carved at the end. It was used by the shepherd to rescue sheep. When the sheep, uh, maybe they fall into a ditch or into a pit, or they are trapped in thick brush or in a thicket, then the shepherd would take the staff 
and he would hook it around the neck of the, of the sheep and pull it out. Or whichever part of the body that was trapped in, an, in a situation that is uncomfortable. So David says that he can consistently see that every time he falls into a ditch, every time things are not working out and he has, he's in a type of crisis, he can see the operations of the staff pulling him out of crisis in his life. And he says that because even the Lord, he is the one who said that he is the good shepherd who lives the 99 sheep that are fine, to go with his staff to rescue the one sheep that has been trapped in a thicket or maybe that has fallen into a pit. And that is the reason why we as Christians, we do not perish in our problems, in our challenges, in the crisis that we enter into. That is why we pull out. That is why we pull out of things that look very difficult. Things that would have killed other people. As they don't kill us. As we pull out. Because his rod and his staff, they are with me. And David says it is evidence that he is with me. Because when I am trapped in a thicket, he is with me. And he is so close to me that he knows that this time my servant is trapped. This time my servant is in a pit. He is so close that he knows. And so therefore David says that is one of the evidences that God is with him. The rod on the other hand is a symbol of authority. It's a symbol of authority. And sometimes the shepherd would use it to, to correct and to guide the flock when, when maybe uh, one of the sheep is going astray uh, out of the path and he would, you know, just strike it softly in order to guide it back to the path. It was a, a tool that could be used for correction and a tool for guiding uh, back to the path and uh, this correction is with love, which the Bible calls chastisement. It is also a tool of protection, which the shepherd would use to defend the sheep from predators, from wolves and from other animals, and from, from anything that would want to, any enemy that would want to harm the sheep. So David says that the presence of God is proven in his life by the consistent guiding, the consistent chastisement that he experiences in his life. Even when he has left the way and the path of God, because in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 11 and 12, I would like us to read that scripture. It's an important scripture. Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs chapter three, verse 11. It says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son whom he delights in. So David is saying that the fact that every time I go out of the path, that God is close enough to know what is happening in my life, and he brings me back to the path using his rod, is evidence that God is with him. I want to use the story of Jonah this morning to try and illustrate how the Lord used the staff and the rod and how the Lord uses the rod and the staff 
in our lives using situations and circumstances. Because let me tell you something. Uh, uh, every time we walk with the Lord, these two tools will be used. Now, when Jonah was preaching the gospel, when Jonah was doing ministry, Israel was not a free nation. Israel was under the colonialism, as we understand it, of the nation of Assyria. And it has been said that of all the enemies of God, there has never been an enemy of Israel that was as cruel as the Assyrians. It has been said that when you tried to, re to rebel against the, the leadership of the Assyrians, what they would do is that they would get you on a hot, sunny morning like this one, and they would call people to a stadium like Nyayo Stadium here and have all the stands filled with people. And then they would get you and hide you in a room and they would skin you alive. They would remove all the top skin of your body. And then they would bring you into the middle of that field on a hot day like this so that you can die a painful death of dehydration so that the people can see, so that they can know what happens to those who try to oppose the leadership of the Assyrians? Some Swahili people used to say, Ili iwe funzo kwako, na kwa wengine kama wewe. The Assyrians were so cruel that they would come to Jerusalem and get slaves and drive them through slave caravans 500 kilometers to the, to the town of Nineveh. And in order for them to make sure that people did not run away, they would put you in a, in a straight line, several lines, and they would drill your cheek or under your lip with a hot piece of iron. And then they would put a chain here and connect you with a person who is in front of you with, another, with, an, with a chain all the way to the front of the row and all the other lines that way. So that when the commander said forward march and the person in front began to walk, all of you followed, not because you want, but because of the pain you were feeling on your face. And it has been said that they had very big dogs that they used to maintain security in those slave caravans. And uh, when a dog, German shepherd type of dogs, and when a dog did something that the soldiers were happy about, the soldier would go into the slave caravans and look for the Jewish women who were pregnant about five months to nine months, and they would drive a sword into the belly of that woman, remove the fetus, and feed the dogs as a reward for what they had done. And so these people were so cruel, and they ruled Israel with an iron hand, and then one day, the word of the Lord came to Israel and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And the Israelites were happy that in forty days their enemy would be destroyed and they would be free. Then the word of God came to a powerful prophet of the day called Jonah and said, Go to Nineveh and preach the preaching that I will give to you. So Jonah decided, because he knew the anointing he carried, and he also knew the God he served. So he decided that he will run away and go to Joppa. And he will hide there for 40 days. So that the people of Nineveh do not hear the word of God. So that they don't repent. So that God does not forgive them. So that God can kill them. So that his nation can be free. So Jonah went to Job to... to uh, he went and boarded a ship to go to, to, to Joppa. When he was in the ship, there was a storm, as you know the story. One thing led to another. They got hold of Jonah and they threw him into the ocean. And then the Bible says in the book of Jonah, chapter 1 and verse 17, that, and the Lord prepared a fish to swallow Jonah. Now that fish that swallowed Jonah, it was not from the devil. It was from God. That is how God was preparing the staff 
by which he would use to bring Jonah back to the path, even though he had decided by himself that he wanted to go to a different location from the location that God had sent him to. So the Bible says, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. That is to tell you another thing, that the fish that swallowed Jonah had been prepared, take note of the word prepared, had been prepared by God. And it was not from the devil. Because God does not subcontract the devil to bring his children back, back to the road, to the way, when they error. He can bring you back to his way all by himself. God does not subcontract Satan in our lives, even when we are wrong. God, the God will not send you Satan. Somebody say amen. amen. God will not send you Satan to bring you back to his way. He uses the stuff. He is able to bring you back to his way because he has tools. The good shepherd, he has tools with which he uses to bring his children back to the way. When they go the other direction. So the Bible says, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So now, I don't know if you are here and you are in the process of being brought back. Because you are heading a direction that was not the will of God. And I want you to know that the process of bringing back is not a sweet process. It is a hard process. It can be painful sometimes. It can be uncomfortable sometimes when the Lord is trying to bring you back. And so, when you are in the process of being brought back, when the staff of God is on your neck or on your leg, bringing you back, what should your response be? Your response should be like the response of Jonah in the next verse. The Bible says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish. If you are in that process of being brought back by the staff of God, what you need to do is to begin organizing yourself and your life to be a person of prayer. Because your prayer, your prayer will quicken the process. Your prayer will quicken the process and you will be able to recover as quickly as possible. There was another man called Peter. Jesus called him and told him, uh, you come. They were in the boat and there was a storm. He said, come. Peter stepped into the, the water and he began to walk. When he began to walk, he began to walk somewhere between the boat and where Jesus was. He began to get afraid. He looked at the storm, at the wind, and at the waves. The Bible says, and he began to sink. The Bible does not say that he sank. It says, he began to sink. And because he knew this scripture, he, when he began to sink, he prayed to the Lord and he said, Master, save me. The Bible says, immediately, the Lord was where he was, holding his hand pulling him back to the surface. And the Bible uh, says they walked together on water back to the boat. So Jonah, the Bible says, Jonah prayed. That is the first important response that you need to have when the rod of God is around your neck, bringing you back. You must begin to organize your life around prayer. What can prayer do to you? What can prayer save? How far can prayer go? Let's go back to Jonah chapter 2 verse 1. How far can prayer go? Can prayer do all things? I will leave you to decide that for you. But I will show you something of where prayer got Jonah from when he was in the belly of that fish, which we are calling the staff of God. The Bible says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Let us go to verse 2. There in verse 1, Jonah has described to you his location. He is in the belly of the fish. 
Jonah is describing to you the location of his physical body. But then Jonah in this prayer, he goes ahead to describe to us the location of his soul. The body is in the belly of the fish. But this boy is telling us, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. And you heard my voice. Sheol, the body is in the fish. The soul is in Sheol. That is what he's saying. Look at verse 3. I want you to tell me, where is this boy? For you cast me into the deep. Where is the deep? Into the heart of the seas. And the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves, they passed over me. Look at verse 5. This boy is describing to us where his soul is. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars, with its bars closed behind me forever. Is this boy alive? Yet you have brought me up, my life from the pit. This guy is telling you where his soul is. In verse 1, he has told you that his body is in the belly of the fish. These other verses, he is telling you that his soul is in Sheol, in the deep, in the pit below the moorings of the mountains. That is where Jonah is. Eh? Then, let's go to the next verse, verse 7. He says, now look at this boy. He is now praying, verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. That was his only solution. I have come to tell you, if you are in a difficult situation, if you pray, God is going to help you. God will not send to you Satan. God is able to help you. Look at what he did to Jonah. Then in verse 8 he says, eh? verse 8, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Verse 9, but I will sacrifice. He does the second thing now. There in the belly of the, wherever he is, he makes a vow. And he says, If I come out of here, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. Not grudgingly. I will sacrifice gladly because I know what you have delivered me from. Look at what he says again. And I will pay what I have vowed. Because salvation is of the Lord. So there are two things that will take you out of that situation. Prayer and sacrifices that you give to the Lord gladly as you fulfill the vows that you have made to God. Then in verse 10, the Bible says, So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry ground. Somebody say amen. amen. You will also be vomited. If you pray, you will be vomited by what has swallowed you. What is making you to cry? It will vomit you. Just do the right thing. You will be vomited by your problems. And Jonah was vomited on dry, on dry ground. And then the Bible says in chapter 3 verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. He has not only been vomited, he has been given a second chance. And Jonah, when he was vomited, he stretched himself like this. Then he stretched himself like this again. When he stretched himself like this the third time, he saw a big notice board that was saying, Welcome to Nineveh. He was vomited in the exact place that he was supposed to be if he would have taken the right path. So, the boy did not lose his destiny 
the fish brought him back to where God had sent him, even though the ride was uncomfortable, the staff brought him back to the path. I have come to tell you something. That even though the staff of God is uncomfortable on your life, when God is through with you, you will come to the exact place you should have been if everything would have been right. And the people that think that they had defeated you or they are in front of you at Iwamekushinda, they will suddenly be shocked that you are also here. You are also here. When people are told, all of you who are married, lift up your hand. Even you, you are lifting up your hand. And we were saying you are late. I am saying even you, you will lift up your hand. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. When they say the people who have cars, lift up your hand. Even you, a day is coming. You will also lift up your hand. Amen. Somebody say amen. You will be vomited back to the exact place you would have been if everything would have been right. So there is nothing you are going to lose. And that is the reason why God does not subcontract Satan to punish his children when they error. Because the mission of Satan is to kill, is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But the staff of God has got a mission to bring you back to the path and to bring you back to your destiny. Somebody say amen. amen. So that is the stuff eh? in the life of Jonah. So Jonah was told by God, go to Nineveh and preach to them the preaching that I will give you. The exact call. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. The exact call he had in chapter 1. So this boy did not lose anything. What he actually did was that the ride was a little bit uncomfortable. Therefore, I have come to tell you, even though your ride is uncomfortable, you will not lose your call. May the Lord give you a second chance. In the name of Jesus, somebody say amen. I want to show you how God used the rod. That is the staff. I want to show you how God used the rod in the life of Jonah. So Jonah came to Nineveh. And Jonah was a preacher, a powerful preacher. He entered into Nineveh. The Bible says, now Nineveh was a large city. To walk from one end of Nineveh to the other was a journey of three days. The Bible says, but Jonah began to enter into that town. And he was preaching powerfully. You know, the topic of his sermon was yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Let me tell you the anointing that this young man was carrying. It was so powerful. People began to repent. Even not the third day. It did not take him three days. To Even the DCI, they took word to state house. And they told the king, well, a man of God has come to our town. There has never been a man that has ever preached the way this man is preaching. By the way, there is something I forgot to tell you. Archaeologists digging in the Middle East a few years ago, they found the remains of the old city of Nineveh. And one of the things they found was a big rock, a big wall that had an inscription about Jonah. And on that inscription, the people of Nineveh called him the silver-tongued orator. That when he began to talk, you did not want him to finish. When he began to talk, God was working through his life. And so this silver-tongued orator, he began to preach in that city. People began to repent. The word went to the king. And the king was told, this is what is happening. There is a revival in the city center. There is a revival in Nairobi West. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, the king made a declaration. He said, every person, let nobody eat. Let nobody drink. Everybody is going to fast for three days and three nights. Even the animals, let them not be given food. 
Even that day, even the dogs did not eat. Even the cats were not given milk. If nothing ate. And on that day, the Bible says, the entire city of Nineveh, they prayed to God. They fasted to God in ashes, in sackcloth. They repented. Everybody, everybody got saved. And Jonah became the first and the only preacher in the Bible who ever achieved a hundred percent result. There is no other preacher in the history of the gospel whoever went to a town and preached until every man, every woman, every child repented together with their domesticated animals. Every, Jonah is the only one. He is the only preacher in the Bible who has achieved a hundred percent result. Even Jesus did not achieve a hundred percent result. The Bible says when he went to preach, some people believed, some people did not. Even Paul did not achieve a hundred percent result. The Bible says when he went, some people believed, some people stoned him. Jonah achieved a hundred percent result because in verse 10, verse 10, let's go to verse 10. The Bible says, then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. He achieved a hundred percent result. On that day, Jonah became the greatest orator in the history of the gospel. The only other person who could speak better than Jonah is Jesus. Because in the Bible they said, they sent people to his meeting and they came back to the Sadducees and reported and said, nobody ever spoke like this man. And on that day, even when Jesus came, he recognized Jonah. They told Jesus, what will you do so that we can believe you? Jesus told them, I will do like Jonah. He recognized Jonah. He was the best. But look at this guy who is the best. Chapter 4 verse 1. Now this is the rod. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he became very angry. Yani the guy has made history. He has become the greatest preacher under the sun. But he is unhappy because God has saved people he did not, that he wanted dead. That is the rod. God can chastise you. And it is not a must that the chastisements of God must put you in hospital or in a coffin. God can chastise you silently. When he begins to prosper people that you have always looked down on. <laughs> people that you have spoken publicly about and you have said, oh, you are wazy. And alafu mungu wana kuonyesha, akiweza. Paka ukitokea where you said those words, unanyenyeke, unanyenyekea. Now, so he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, see, this is what I told you. Eh? You are good. Look at verse 3. Then he says, now he's throwing a temper tantrum. This great man of God. Therefore now, O oh Lord, kill me. Take my life. If you are not killing these guys, kill me. Yani, this guy is a true Jew. And this is how Jews are. He's a true Jew who feels that God is ours. We are the correct people. We are the special people. We are the chosen people. And God has humbled him. You see, Jonah was in the belly of the fish. What did he do? He prayed. He, re he repented. God forgave him and the fish vomited him. He went to Nineveh and he preached to the people. Even before they entered the belly of the fish, they did what Jonah did in chapter 2. They prayed. They repented. God forgave them. Now this man is very angry. He wants people to be killed so that it can prove that he is a man of God. Like some of the preachers and the prophets we have in our times today who tell you if you question what he has said, you will be struck by lightning. 
<laughs> now God, well, you see, God is asking John, is it right for you to be angry? Umejamu kweli. Is it right for you to be angry? Look at what Jonah is answering. Jonah said, hey, Jonah said, yes, I am nini. Look at verse 5. Now verse 5 is where now the Lord is preparing the road. This is the road. So Jonah went out of the city. You know, he has thrown a temper tantrum because he wants to force God to change his nature because he is anointed, because he is a Jew. He wants God to change his nature from being a merciful God, a forgiving God, to a killer God. Because the man of God has thrown a temper tantrum. So he went and, uh, out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what will become of the city. He has already told God, if you don't kill them, kill me. Agaka Aone, the choice of God. Look at the choice of God. Now God prepared. You remember God prepared a fish. And that fish was the staff. Now God is preparing the rod. And the Lord God prepared a plant. And made it. And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. Verse 10. But the Lord said, you are having pity on a plant for which you have not labored. You have not made it grow. Which came up by night and perished in a night. Yani hata amukuwa mumebond. Just a few minutes. And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and much livestock. Leave that scripture there. Now, Jonah, God is telling Jonah, you, you are having pity on a plant. Should I not pity people? Should I not love people? Are you forcing me to change my nature that I should now love plants? And hate people. And so Jonah spread. God hit him. At the core. Of his Jewish pride. And identity. Because Jonah. Was a true Jew. And he believed that God should hear him. And not hear anybody else. But we said that the rod. Is also. A tool that can be used for protection. That it is a tool by which God uses to protect, the shepherd would use to protect the sheep. And that God would use this tool. And he uses this tool to protect his children from their enemies. Whether they are physical enemies or spiritual enemies. And here now, God has got a new flock of children. He calls them 120,000 people who cannot discern between their right hand and their left. Do you know why they cannot discern between their right hand and their left? Because they are new converts. New converts. They just repented yesterday. They just stopped sinning yesterday. They, are now, they have put themselves into the hands of God. And now this great preacher 
who the only man who has ever achieved a hundred percent result is trying to incite God against these new converts. Eh? God against new converts. And God is telling him, I will not do that. So God is using the rod now to defend the people of Nineveh from his own servant. Because that's the problem we have in many churches. And believers, they stopped fighting us because they knew we are men of God. Now God has got to protect us from the very people that we preach with. They are the ones who want us dead. The Muslims don't want us dead. They don't want us finished. They don't want us down. It is our fellow preachers. <laughs> it is our fellow preachers. And this preacher who wants new converts dead is one of the most decorated preachers. You know, when T.B. Joshua died, I was shocked at some of the things Nigerian preachers were saying. And that is the day, I will not tell you. So I was shocked that preachers can be rejoicing at the death of a man of God. How do you do that? At to say that he died because Mimi Nimwamba. Well, what's that? God now needs to protect us from those we are preaching with. Because those that we used to drink with, they have released us and they wish us well. <laughs> it is these preachers who don't want us. It is these men and women of God that God now is, and I have come to tell you, that God is able, using his rod, to protect you adequately. I have come to tell you, just because a Nigerian preacher does not want you alive, you are not going to die. God will not kill you in order just to make somebody happy. To boost your ego, it will not happen. Mutanyenyeke. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah. Because God does not kill his children. And this preacher is very decorated. He's the only man who has ever gotten a hundred percent result. And you know who was Jonah? Jonah, hey, Jewish, Jewish writings, they say. You remember Elijah when he went to the, to the widow of Zarapath. And the widow of Zarapath told him, I have only one loaf of bread. We want to eat with my son and then we die. That lady who brought Elijah into his home and she, he lived there for three and a half years and the lady's son died and Elijah brought that son back to life. That boy is John. That was Jonah's mother. Google, Sai. <laughs> Google to Apo Andika is Jonah the son of the widow of Zerapath. Google. You know, we are always telling you that he has to live in What has viewer? What you are doing, Lipia feast. Somebody say amen. A preacher that is that decorated before God, trying to convince God to turn against a new convert, God told him, eh, eh. He used the rod now to protect Nineveh against his own servant. I have come to tell you that you are protected. There is nobody who can go to Catalonia until you die. Those prayers will not be answered. Somebody say amen. amen. Nobody can go to fast and pray until your husband leaves you. Those prayers will not be answered. In the name of Jesus, somebody say amen. amen. But Jonah was not saying that because he is a bad man. Jonah is not evil. He's just a Jew. It's just a Jew. He was speaking. He was, his actions were informed from the nature of his background. There was another guy that was protected by the father using the rod. He's called the prodigal son. Protected from his own brother. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15, I think it begins from verse 11, that there used to be a man who had two sons. Eh? A man had two sons. Can you find it if you are able? And the younger one said, 
And the younger one of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them, not to him, to them, his livelihood. He divided it into the middle. He gave this one yake and this one yake. Everybody was given. This boy was not the only one that was given. And many days after that, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Then one thing led to another, because you know the story. He decided to come back home to his father. When he came back home to his father, his father received him, and he threw a party. He invited the neighbors. He gave him a ring. He gave him a good coat. He slaughtered the fatted calf, cow. Eh? And there was a party. And the older brother came from wherever he was working. And he heard the sound of celebration. And he asked the servants, what's happening there? The servants were also happy. They told him, kuna happen. Your young brother has come back. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Look at the Jewish mentality. Verse 28. But he was angry. And he would not go in. Therefore his father came out. Now the father has begun to defend his prodigal son. He came out to plead with the older brother. Because he has got to protect his weaker son. He came to plead with him. Look at verse 29. He said, so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you have never given me even a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. You see, he's saying he has never been given. Look at verse 30. But as soon as this son of yours, he is disowning him. He can't call him my brother. He's calling him your son. Who has devoured your livelihood with harlots? You killed the fatted calf for him. Look at the reply of the father. But he said to the son, You are always with me, and all I have is yours. Because Yake Sinilishampe, what we remained with is your portion. So both of them, they mismanaged finances. They mismanaged wealth, both of them. One mismanaged by spending it in prodigal living. The other one mismanaged by doing nothing. And he felt he was good because he had done nothing. When you go back to the story of the talents, one was given five, another was given Sijui three, and another one was given one. The one who was given one, he did nothing. He buried that talent. He buried that talent. When the master came, uh, the master called him, you lazy and wicked servant. That when God has given you wealth, if you do nothing with it, he considers you lazy and wicked. So these two guys were both wicked. They were wicked in different ways. That is what we mean when we say, you sin differently. You are not holy. You sin differently. But because you sin differently, you feel you are holier than the ones. <laughs> so he was feeling he is holier than this other one. And yet even him, he had failed because he had wealth for many years and he did nothing. So the father told him, all that I have is yours. Look at the next verse. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For this your brother, the New King James Version says, for this your brother, you remember he called him your son. Now the father is telling him, this your brother was dead and he is alive again and was lost and is found. 
he has used the rod there in two ways. One, to rebuke, to chastise, and to bring the elder brother back to the right concept. And two, to protect the prodigal son from his own brother. And he protects him by telling him, this your brother, he was dead. He calls him your brother. Even though this one wanted to call him your son, God is telling him, he is your brother. Even when he was wasting money, he was still your brother. Even when he went to that far country, he never stopped being your brother. He was still your brother. So the Lord tells the father, tells this man, this your brother, he was dead, but now he's alive. You know the wonderful thing about when God uses the rod, the argument gets finished. Every time that God has used the rod to reason with his people, nobody ever has an argument beyond that. That story ends there. The next verse is a different parable. Because there was nothing else that this boy could present before God when he has used his rod to correct him and to protect his younger brother. And the story of Jonah gets finished abruptly. Because after God has used his rod to change Jonah's perspective and to protect the new converts of Nineveh, there is no more argument that Jonah could present before God. I have come to talk to some people as I finish who are in a situation where you need to be defended. You need to be defended from your very own, from your very own brothers, from your very own family, from your very own workmates, from your very own business colleagues. I have come to tell you, fear not, the Lord is able. And he is not only able, he is willing. You shall be protected by the rod and by the staff of God. And the conclusion of the whole matter is very simple. It is this. Because of the rod and because of the staff, in spite of ourselves, we shall all be pulled back. And we shall make it. We shall make it. When the trumpet sounds, because that's the most important thing. When the trumpet sounds and the Lord descends with the sound of the archangel to call his children home. If you are part of the flock of the good shepherd, he shall have prepared you. He shall have put you on the way. And you shall make it because of the rod and the staff. And that is why at the end, David said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even though sometimes it is painful, even though sometimes it is uncomfortable, they comfort me. What comforts me in that? It is the end result. It is the end result that comforts the end result that we are still here. The end result that he will still bring you to green pastures. The end result that he will still make you to lie down beside still waters. That is the end result that comforts, that makes you to forget the painful process which you have gone through because the rod and the staff, after he is through with you, they comfort you when you see the results. Somebody say amen. amen. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for your rod and your staff. I want to thank you because they comfort us. We shall succeed even in spite of ourselves because of that rod and because of that staff. And Lord, I want to thank you this morning and I want to bless your name 
Because by this rod and staff, you have followed us into the trenches. You have followed us into the thickets. And you have comforted us. And you have lifted us up. Receive glory. Receive honor. And Lord, we shall continue to praise your name. And we shall continue to sacrifice and to pay our vows with gladness because we know where you have gotten us from. In Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Somebody say amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap offering as our bishop comes. Hey, Patia Yesu coffee for the man of God. Hallelujah. Let's rise up on our feet. Let's appreciate Pastor Musioka for blessing.